would have ever thought you'd be in church with 3D glasses on? You know, it's always been fascinating to me. 3D glasses, 3D movies, I don't know why. It's just been a fascinating thing my whole life. When I was a kid, I can distinctly remember going to Disney World for the very first time. I can remember pulling up to Epcot that very first day and seeing that big silver ball, which in 1986 was probably the craziest thing I had ever seen. But it was there at Epcot where I had my first fully immersive 3D experience. And some of you may remember this film experience called Captain EO. Do you guys remember Captain EO? One person. You remember Captain EO with the late great, none other than Michael Jackson. Anybody else see that? You remember it now? Anybody? Raise your hand. You saw Captain EO. Okay. It's okay. Uh, it's, uh, you're missing out. But anyways... It was incredible. Let me just explain to you what it was about. There were lasers involved. There was smoke. There were uh, these synchronized dancing sequences where they were fighting monsters. I mean, come on, guys. It was awesome. But the most incredible part of the whole experience for me were the the 3D glasses. I had never seen these before. And it was fascinating because without the glasses, everything was blurry. Everything was fuzzy. I couldn't even tell what I was looking at half the time. I saw some of you doing that a second ago. You're like right? And you're like, I can't see anything. And then I can see everything, which is why it would blew my mind in the first place. Because in one season, it's a blur. In the next season, you're like, Michael Jackson is dancing and he's singing and he's fighting monsters. And it was awesome. I I couldn't see what I was supposed to see without the glasses. But when I put the glasses on and I looked through the colorful lenses, literally everything in front of me changed. Hey, today we're kicking off a three-week series that I want to call Beyond Imagination. And throughout this series, I want you to see when you look through God goggles, and when you look through uh, and see the world as God sees the world, you're going to see things that you could never see on your own. There's something about it. When you start looking through his lenses instead of your lenses, it's amazing how everything changes. Would you agree that there's a big difference between our vision and God's vision? There's a big difference between what we want to do and what God wants us to do. But I can promise you this. Every single time, God's vision is greater than our vision. Hey, no matter what you're talking about, if you've got your perspective and God's perspective, your vision and God's vision, his is going to be better than yours 100% of the time. How many of you would love to know God's complete, clear vision for your life? Would you just raise your hand? That's about 80%. Some of you are like, no, thanks. Um, I'm good. How many of you would love to know God's vision for your family, God's vision for your kids, God's vision for your church? You just want to see what God sees. I'd say that's most of us here today. But I think the real question we should be asking isn't just, what's God's vision for us? A better question, a question I I think we should be asking is this, when God does reveal his vision, will I be faithful in fulfilling my mission? Because it's one thing to see it, it's another thing to move towards it. If you have your Bible, I'd like to invite you to join me in the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 1 is where we're going to camp out today. You know, when I think about a person of great vision, I think of Nehemiah. And when it comes to sensing God's vision and then acting on that vision, I think we can learn a lot through Nehemiah's story. So turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 1. As you're turning there, let me give you a little background, a little context so you can, you can know what, what it is we're jumping into today. You know, the book of Nehemiah begins in the year 586 B.C., 586 B.C. That was the year where Jerusalem was conquered by the Babylonians. And when that happened, the first temple was destroyed. The walls of the city were completely demolished. And the majority of Israelites that were living in Jerusalem in that day were taken into captivity in Babylon. Well, fast forward 47 years. 47 years later, the year now is 539 BC, King Cyrus of Persia conquers Babylon. And when that happened, it marked the beginning of Persian rule over the former Babylonian territories, which also included Judah. So now the Persian king is in charge and he decides he's going to allow all the Israelites to return to their homeland. Well, here's why you need to know all that stuff to begin with. It's because Nehemiah worked for the king of Persia, but he was a Jew. So he was a Jewish official serving as the cupbearer for the Persian king, Artaxerxes. 
So now as we open our Bibles up to the book of Nehemiah, I want you to see the scene. Here it is. You ready? You've got a Jewish guy working closely with the Persian king. And all of a sudden, he hears firsthand about the dire conditions of his hometown, Jerusalem. He's hearing about his friends, and he's hearing about his family members back in Jerusalem. These would have been people that he loved, people that, according to verse 3, were people in great trouble and disgrace, the Bible says. So for Nehemiah, the news about his city broke his heart. And I want us to see three things from this story today that we need to know from God's word. I hope you're taking notes. If you are, get this first. We're going to look at the burden of vision. The burden of vision. In fact, big vision typically begins with a big burden. If you look at big vision throughout the world, most of the time there was a burden that initiated that that vision that, that, that took place. Big vision typically begins with a burden. And at the beginning of this chapter, that's what we see. Nehemiah's heart was heavy. He had a burden for his people. He had a burden for the city. In fact, when you get to Nehemiah 1, verse 3, it says, Jerusalem's wall has been broken down and its gates have been burned. When Nehemiah realized that his city walls were in ruin and his people were left vulnerable and without security or protection, that bothered him. It bothered him. That, he was bothered by that. And so you know what Nehemiah decided to do? He decided to pray about it. When he was bothered by it, he decided to pray about it. In fact, look at verse 4. He said, when I heard these words, I sat down and wept. I mourned for a number of days, fasting and praying before the God of the heavens. So right away you see the burden of vision. But very quickly you see the role of prayer as well. The role of prayer. You know, there are 12 different prayers in the book of Nehemiah. This book is basically a 25-year-old, 2,500-year-old prayer journal that we have the privilege of reading today. And I'm glad we do, because in this book, the Lord shows us when God puts a burden on our heart, he expects us to put a prayer on our lips. Do you see that? This ought to be a response. When God puts a burden on our heart, the first thing we ought to do is have a prayer on our lips. Nehemiah had a burden for his city, and so what does he do? He prays. But notice, as soon as his heart was moved and his voice, and he voiced his burden, he was quick to pray and seek wisdom from the Lord. The Bible says he wept. Hey, when's the last time you wept in prayer? He was weeping because of his burden. He mourned for days, the Bible said. He fasted. He got on his knees. He sought the Lord. This is a man that had a burden, but he had a prayer. See, it didn't stop there. A lot of times we stop there. We're, we're burdened for something, and we're like, I'm going to pray for that. And that's not what Nehemiah, he didn't just pray for that and then stop. No, he, he continued on. And what started as a burden was solidified through prayer, and his prayer was, number three, the catalyst for action. His prayer was a catalyst for action. Don't miss this today. Nehemiah had a burden on his heart, he had a prayer on his lips, but he had a vision for his life, a vision for his life. He didn't just pray for his friends and pray for his city and then stop and do nothing. No. After he was moved to pray, he was quickly moved to action. In fact, you look at chapter two, you turn the page and now Nehemiah is approaching the king. He's going to his boss and he says in verse four, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor with you, Send me to Judah and to the city where my ancestors are buried so that I what? I may rebuild it. He's saying, put me in, coach. I don't want to just pray about it. I don't want to just talk about it. Put me in. Let me do what God is calling me to do. That's what you read in Nehemiah's story. It's a pattern that I believe we ought to apply to our life. It starts with God putting a, a burden on his heart. And then you see a prayer on his lips. And then you see he is looking through his God goggles and he's seeing God's vision for his life. But he doesn't just see the vision. Number four, Nehemiah moved forward by faith and he chose to make a difference with his life. God, I want my life to make a difference for you. But not only did it affect his life, keep reading. And what you're going to see is this. He brought people with him. He brought people with him on the journey. Verse 17 says, so I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. 
Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned. He say, come, let, let's rebuild Jerusalem's wall. He's waving them on so that we will no longer be a disgrace. I told them how the gracious hand of my God had been on me and what the king had said to me. And they said, let's start rebuilding. And their hands were strengthened to do this good work. It wasn't just Nehemiah by himself. No, the people of God went with him. Hey, get this today. God's vision will always move God's people. If you agree with that, say amen. God's vision will always move God's people. If you're not a people of God, if you're not a person of God, you may not be moved by the vision of God. But if you are God's people, you will be moved by God's vision. Has God ever called you to do something you just didn't want to do? Shake your head if you've been there before. You're like, yeah. You know, there's a lot of times where God calls us to do something that just wasn't part of our plan, something that we just don't want to do. In fact, I'm doing it right now. Did you know when I was growing up, the only thing I ever told the Lord, I will not do this, is this right here. (laughs) I'm dead serious. My whole childhood, because I was a preacher's kid. People are like, one day you're going to be just like your dad. You're going to preach and you're going to, I was like, no, I'm not. I'm just telling you straight up. I'm not going to do that. And there were times in my prayer closet, I'm, I'm looking at the Lord saying, I don't care what you call me to do. I ain't doing that. Amen. And if you've ever done this, you understand why. Amen. But but that's the only thing in my life I've ever said, I will not do that. And the reason that is because I had my own plan for my life. You know, sometimes your plans, they get in the way. And I had a plan. When I went to college, I had it all, I had the path figured out. I was going to college. I was going on the pre-law track. I wanted to become a lawyer. I wanted to, I wanted to find myself in the courtroom. And ultimately, I was hoping that a law career would lead me into politics. My goal was to go to D.C., and to be with all the crazy people in D.C. That's what I wanted for my life. And praise God, he had another plan. But, but that's what I wanted. That was my goal. And the whole time I'm wrestling with these goals, I'm also wrestling with this call to ministry. Because in the back of my mind, in the back of my heart, I always sensed that God was, he was calling me into ministry. But to be honest, I didn't want to do what God was calling me to do. I know that's not super spiritual to say that. But some of you understand where I was at. I didn't want to do what God was calling me to do. You know why? It's because I knew God's vision was going to move me. It was going to move my priorities. God's vision was going to change my plans. It was going to require sacrifices on my part. And to be quite frank, I didn't want to sacrifice. You ever been there before? That's where I was. But you know what I did? I prayed about it. And it was through prayer that God confirmed my call. Don't miss this today. When it comes to fulfilling God's vision, prayer should always precede action. Prayer should always precede action. If God's calling you to do something, he loves to confirm his call through prayer. He loves it when you seek his face and seek his wisdom. He loves it when when you come to the Lord in prayer. But let me just say this. Once God confirms his call, and when God, once God tells you this is what you should do, or this is where you should go, or this is what you should give, he expects you to move no matter the cost. And a lot of times that's where we get tied up, because we don't want to do what God's calling us to do. See, God put a burden on Nehemiah's heart, but he also had a plan to move Nehemiah's feet. He was taking him from a, a steady job working with this king, and he was mobilizing him for leadership, mobilizing him on a mission that he may not have come up with on his own, but God was calling him to do something great. Listen, pursuing God's vision will always require action. And we need to know this today. Pursuing God's vision will always require action. You say, well, Jordan, I'm not in an action mode. I'm in a wait mode. You know, I read Isaiah chapter 40, and it says, those who wait on the Lord, he will renew their strength. So I'm just going to sit here on a park bench and do nothing, and I'm going to wait for the Lord to strike somebody with a lightning bolt or move me or whisper in my ear. And let me just tell you something. That's not what it means to wait on the Lord. When you look up that word wait in the Hebrew in Isaiah chapter 40, it's the Hebrew word quava, and it literally means to be bound to something. It means to to attach yourself to something. To wait on the Lord 
is like signing up for a three-legged race where it's you and God connected to one another. And to wait on him means you are connecting yourself to God. And now, because you're connected, you're bound to God. When he goes, you're going. When he says stop, you're stopping. When he says it's time to roll, then it's time to roll. Because ultimately, when you bound yourself to God, when you tether yourself to God, you're tethering yourself to a God that is in control. So you're submitting to that control and you're saying, God, as I wait on you, I'm going to follow your leadership. And when you say go, I'm not going to argue. I'm not going to hesitate. I am going to submit to your leadership. I'm going to go. You know, when I think about our church's history, and as I look back on the vision moments that make up our timeline, I see a lot of that in our story. I see a church that's been tethered to God throughout throughout history. And I see the same sequence of events that Nehemiah experienced 2,500 years ago. It looks very similar to what we've experienced as a church family throughout our history. In this series, I want to show you some things about our church. I want to show you where we've been and where we currently are. But I also want to talk about where I believe God is taking us in the days to come. And as I think about our history and where we've been, I think about pastors like Marvin Gibson. I didn't have the privilege of knowing Marvin Gibson. He was here in the 1970s, and I believe he was a great visionary of the Lord. In fact, I think about Marvin in 1977. He he said God gave him a vision that we as a church should purchase a camp, a camp called Camp Cherokee. And he brought this vision to the church, and he's like, I believe the Lord's telling us that we should do this. And that had to seem like the craziest idea back in those days. For a church to buy a camp, like, what is this guy thinking? But you know what? He was confident in bringing that to the church because he said God's vision was clear. And once he had God's vision, they prayed about it. And then you know what happened after they prayed? God confirmed the vision. And as a result, our church had the confidence to move forward with great faith and to purchase this piece of land called Camp Cherokee. (laughs) Amen. Amen. Somebody's been to camp. But I just can't even begin to imagine how God used that decision. Think about that. How God used that one act of obedience, that one act of sacrifice, when the church probably couldn't afford to do any of that stuff. But that decision has completely reshaped the landscape, not only of our city, but the landscape of eternity. I mean, when you look at that history, there have been hundreds, if not thousands, of spiritual decisions that were made on that campsite over the past 47 years. If you've ever made a decision for Christ or, or, or seen a decision for Christ be made at Camp Cherokee, would you just raise your hand? Look around and praise God for that, right? Praise God for people in 1977 who had the courage to say yes to what God was calling them to. I think about back in the 70s, God's the one who, he gave Marvin Gibson the vision to do the Family Life Center across the street, which for decades was a hub for life and ministry in the city. He gave him the the vision originally in the 1970s to move our church's location from the downtown location to where we currently sit. Did you realize that? God gave Marvin Gibson that vision in the 1970s. But as the story's been told to me, when he presented that vision to the church, The church said, no, we don't want to move. We're good right here. We've got a property already. We're we're good. And the church said, we're not going to move. Now, it wasn't until nearly 40 years later when God reaffirmed that vision in Alan Lockerman's heart that the church actually moved. And although it was difficult, the church prayed about it. And Brother Alan is the one who led our church to relocate way out here in the sticks Back in the day, about 14, 15 years ago. By the way, they they say that this is way out in the sticks back in the day. Somebody told me when I moved here, they said, if if you used to live where the church is, you would have to drive towards town to go deer hunting. All right? It's that far out in the country. The deer are closer to town. But, you know, that's that's out here, and that's that's a big move, a big faith step. But we're here today because God put a vision on his heart. And when he did, people prayed. And the vision was confirmed. But prayer didn't slow down the vision. It fueled the vision. And our church decided to say yes. They moved forward by faith, doing what God told them to do. And today, here we are. Now, was it challenging? Absolutely. Was it expensive? You bet. But was it worth it? Absolutely. God's been good to us, hasn't he? 
You know what I've been reminded of? If you do what God calls you to do, it'll always be worth it. If you do what God calls you to do, it will be worth it in the end. How has God blessed our church since making that faith move in 2010? Some of you have been here. How many of you were here in 2010 making the walk? You wore the red shirt. You wore it proudly. You did the thing. Several of us. Not us, y'all. But you've been here. You've seen this story. But how has God blessed First Baptist Cleveland since making that move? Let me hit you with a couple of just quick facts. Are you ready for this? Since that day, 14 years ago, did you realize that our worship attendance, people who worship here on a Sunday morning, has more than doubled? Isn't that fascinating? Doubled. People who attend Bible studies, people who are connected in community groups, doubled. In that short span of time, our church membership has grown by 2,453 people. 2,400 people. And if that doesn't get you fired up, hopefully this one does. Since making the move, over 3,800 people have been saved and baptized in that tank. Amen? Amen. 3,800 people. Hey, I say that to just remind you, this is a God story. And to God be the glory. God always blesses obedience. He's a holy God. He doesn't bless disobedience. But he has a knack for blessing obedience. And it's hard to, it's hard to ignore the blessings of God and the hand of God on our church as you walk through our timeline. Whether you're talking about how this campus has made an impact on our community or how God has expanded our reach through TV ministry. I think about over 20 years ago, God put that vision on Alan Lockerman's heart to be on local TV, regional TV, local radio. That was, a, that was an Alan Lockerman and Jesus conversation that launched a beautiful ministry. In fact, let me ask you by show of hands, how many of you, before you came to First Baptist, you heard a sermon, you watched a sermon, you listened to a sermon, you did something through TV, through radio, or through the internet? Would you just raise your hand? Look around. You think about how God used that decision 20 plus years ago to bring us to where we are today. And who would have ever thought that that would have been a decision that would launch us to where we are today, where right now we are literally in hundreds of millions of homes through national TV, through international TV, through streaming, all over the world, preaching the gospel in multiple languages. And, And all of that's happening because God put a vision on Alan Lockerman's heart a couple of decades ago. Just on every single page of our story, you see the same progression. And here's the breakdown for you. You ready? God put a burden on our heart. God put a prayer on our lips. God revealed his vision for our church. And God's people move forward by faith. You know, my first conversation with Alan Lockerman, it went something like this. He said, I believe God's given us a clear vision for our church. I believe there's coming a day where First Baptist Cleveland is a multi-site church, and we have campuses up and down I-75. He also said, God's also clearly told me, I ain't going to be the guy to do it. And so you got to do it if it's going to (laughs) happen. But I remember that conversation thinking, man, God has been very clear with his vision. And you know what? How cool is it right now to know six and a half years later, as we worship in this place, We have part of our family worshiping in Udawa as a part of our Spirit City campus where people are being saved, discipled, baptized, raised raised up to make a difference in that, that, that neighborhood. And it's cool to see how God continues to expand our territory by allowing us to plant campuses in our region. And you know what? I think God's just getting started with that. How cool is that? That that's a vision. Amen. That started a long time ago. But that's how it works. You say, how did that happen? Well, God gave our church a burden for our region. We have a burden for our region. And we started praying that God would allow us to reach our region. And after we prayed, we sensed God's vision. And then we said, let's go for it. Why wouldn't we go for it? Listen, this moment called life is going to be over in about five seconds. We're all going to be in heaven or hell somewhere. So we might as well go for it, making this town and this region the hardest place to live and not go to heaven. Amen? Hey, this ought to be, that, that's our mission. That's why we do what we do. I think about a long time ago, God gave Jim Gibson a vision and gave him a vision of our church supporting missions and missionaries around the world. They said, why not us? Why wouldn't we do that? And yet today as we worship, we are being represented in 19 different countries on six different continents doing the work that Jesus commissioned us to do 2,000 years ago. You, church. Right now, you are involved. You are present as the body of Christ in places like Egypt and Ethiopia, 
places like Mauritania and places like Kenya. You're like, how did all that happen? Same way everything else happened. God gave us a burden for the nations. And we started praying, God, position us to make a difference for your kingdom in all of these places. And then he solidifies his vision through prayer. And then we as a church decide we're going to go for it. Why wouldn't we go for it? Listen, in 2018, that's when we showed up. And very quickly, we could sense and see that we were right in the middle of a God story. We could sense that God had a vision and a plan for this, this church. And so we quickly relaunched something called the Generations Campaign. Generations Phase 2. The building where we initially launched in in 2010 was Generations Phase 1. But we knew that God still had some work to do. And so we launched into this vision that was a great, great faith journey. And it was designed to expand this campus so that we would be prepared to reach even more people and make an impact in this city for decades and decades to come. So how did that happen? Well, you guessed it. It began by having a burden for our city. And after we thought about the burden that God had given us, we started praying for God's vision. He solidified that that vision, and we as a church decided in 2019 to go for it. Now, if you're new here and you weren't a part of that Generations Phase 2 campaign, I want to bring you up to speed and show you some of the things we're currently working, working on and what we've launched uh, in 2020. One of the things, we took our current space and we did a complete redesign, a facelift. We painted walls. We, we added some technology. We brought our old space up to speed and prepared it for our building and our expansion. After we did the facelift, we very quickly did the sport court project, which was a lot of fun. We looked at what used to be a, a swampy grass field that wasn't used for anything, and we quickly created a design for the sport courts, making this uh, a, a place for the community to come and to be involved. And we've seen some incredible ministry take place on those turf fields and on those courts. We also did a warehouse project. Now, this isn't real cool or whatever, but this was a stewardship decision for our church. Prior to having the warehouse, we used to spend a lot of money storing stuff off-site. It wasn't efficient at all. We had stuff everywhere, and someone way smarter than me put together a plan to build this warehouse, which would streamline efficiency and save us a lot of money over time. In fact, they said this warehouse would pay for itself in just three years. So it's almost paid for itself two different times already. We also knew that we needed more parking spaces. So we added a parking lot in the back with over 300 parking places, and it's still kind of jacked up. All right, we got some work to do here. Uh, If you park there, I'm sorry, but there's space for you to park your car. But that's not completed yet. That's a part of what's coming next. But, But we knew we had to have more space for vehicles, and so we added new parking lots. We also added more lobby space as a part of our new building, We added a a huge lobby, and if you've been around here at any time, you understand that these commons buildings in the lobby, we use those just about every single day for ministry events, for community events, and it's been a huge blessing to have additional space for those larger gatherings. But not only did we create a new lobby, we also connected that to a brand new preschool and kids building, which is incredible. If you haven't been in this building, it is a state-of-the-art facility Uh, that's built for our preschoolers and our children up to fifth grade. There's also a special needs facility in that new expansion. You say, why do you need that much space? And why why do you need that much room for our kids? Here's what you may not realize. Every single Sunday, this Sunday included, in that building alone, we will see between birth and fifth grade over 800 children that show up to hear about Jesus. Isn't that cool? 800 children are coming and they're hearing the gospel. They're learning about Christ. They're being discipled. They're learning how to worship. They're interacting with believers who are investing in them. And that is one of the greatest investments our church has ever made. Because the next, not 10 years, the next 20 years, the next 30 years, the next 40 years, that's going to be a hub for ministry that I believe will make an incredible impact for the kingdom and our community uh, for, for years to come. And not only did we create a bunch of classrooms, here's, here's the thing. I believe that for a kid, church ought to be a lot of fun. You ought to have a great time. And if you come here, I want this to be the most fun place that you'll be all week long. So we, did, we made sure that happened a couple of different ways. One of them, we created an awesome indoor playground. Now, this playground 
ain't Chuck E. Cheese, and it's not just Chick-fil-A. This thing is, is, is actually rated to have 120 kids playing at the same time. Now, if you're a volunteer and there's actually 120 kids there, I'm just going to tell you, y'all need to leave, all right? Because it's crazy. It's wild. But this right here is an investment in fun and making sure that kids want to go to church. We also created a cool outdoor space for our children, which is it's turf field. It's a place for them to run wild and burn energy before going home with you. Uh, but we just see that as an investment, investment in the next generation. And we already see how God's using that facility in an incredible, incredible way. Uh, we also created a new courtyard. This was wasted space. This was space in between buildings. And we put a little bit of a, of, of a strategic plan together for this to be a place where receptions could happen, Bible studies, gatherings. There's also a, a porch on the second deck here with rocking chairs. We see people spending time with the Lord and having discipleship conversations on that deck every single day of the week. And so that courtyard has been a blessing as well. We also renovated old space and created what we currently call the senior adult wing. Uh, this used to be where the children were, but we put some elbow grease and some paint and some carpet together. And now this area, it's actually not senior adults. We were going to call it the senior adult wing, uh, but we figured out that senior adults don't like to be called senior adults. <laughs> and so we call it the adult wing or the old people place, whatever. <laughs> it's all whatever. You call it whatever you want. It doesn't really matter. But it's awesome to have more space uh, for our church to gather. And uh, it's, been a, it's been a huge blessing. Last but not least, we added a massive cross to the front of our building. And it was, uh, yeah. You say, why did we do that? Well, we did that because we wanted to send a massive message to our community, letting them know everything that happens in this place is because of Jesus. Jesus is the center of every single thing that we do. So this entire thing started because God put a burden on our hearts. We as a church have a burden for this city. We have a burden for the lost, a burden for the hurting. We have a burden for those who are vulnerable and have a real need for Jesus in their life, in their marriage, in their family. And so that's why we do all the things that we do. But you know what? That burden, it led us to prayer. And our prayers confirm God's vision. And God's vision led us to respond in great faith. And today, we find ourselves smack dab in the middle of doing what we believe God has called us as a church to do. And hear me when I say this. We are not finished. In fact, we're not even close to being finished. We're just getting started. And understand, in order for us to take our next steps of faith, every single one of us are going to have to get more involved. Hear me like it's just me and you talking right now. Every single one of us are going to have to make more sacrifices. Every single one of us are going to have to dig deep and get even more generous. We're going to have to prioritize eternity in different ways. And we're going to talk more details regarding what that looks like beginning even next week. But when we started this faith journey, we knew if God blesses this, we could potentially run into some space issues. I mean, you start building all these buildings and expanding this territory and you invite all these new people and these new families and people start coming. But then we realize very quickly that, that we, we can very fastly, quickly run out of space here. And, and praise God, we have. Praise God that new people have come. In fact, if you started coming to First Cleveland since 2020, would you just raise your hand? Look around the room. You started coming in the last five years. Hey, praise the Lord for that. That's what we prayed for. That's what we were building for, and we're glad that you're here. But we knew that we could potentially run into a problem because now we have all these new kids coming and new families getting involved, but this room right here couldn't be expanded, so this became our lid. And so this right here for me started as a, a huge prayer need. And every single day I committed to praying that God would give us vision that would allow us to prepare for more people. I used to pray, Lord, if you choose to bless this work, then how are we going to accommodate the increase? And I remember after praying that several weeks, I remember when God answered that prayer. It was like, it was just me and God. You ever had one of those moments where it's, it's so clear, it's almost like God picks up the phone and he calls you and he's like, hey, I'm here to talk about what you want to talk about. That, that's what this moment was for me. And he didn't speak audibly, but it was like God was speaking directly to my heart that day. And this is what he said, Jordan, I've got a solution to this upcoming problem. And here it is. Are you ready? I was like, yes, I'm ready. He said, Jordan, for a season, I want you to preach four times on Sunday instead of just three. <laughs> and I immediately responded to the Lord that day, and I said, I'm sorry, I think you have the wrong number. And I hung up. I was like, no. 
No way, right? But in all seriousness, I want you to remember what we just said. If you do what God tells you to do, it'll always be worth it, right? We say God blesses obedience, right? And so if he blesses obedience, here's what that means to me. Most of the time when God calls us to obey, God's actually calling us to sacrifice. When he calls you to obey, most of the time, if you track it, you'll see he's calling you to sacrifice. But how cool is it to look back and to see how God's blessed our obedience and to see how God's blessed our sacrifices? He has. In fact, as a result of launching into four campuses, you might find this interesting. In fact, it was just in January we opened the kids' building. So if you look at the last year, we've actually got five services now if you, if you count the loft at 1015. But, but, but who's counting? It, when we made that, that move, Our church, as a result, is now experiencing what I I believe is the greatest season we've ever had. Because if you track it back and look at just a year ago today, and then look at where our church is today, did you realize that our church has grown by roughly 1,000 people in Cleveland, Tennessee? Is that not incredible? 1,000 people. That's happened in a year. When you look at the last year, 400 people have been baptized since January the 1st. That's what God is doing, y'all, and to God be the glory. I mean, just think about how God has blessed our church. People are being saved. Lives are being changed. Relationships are being restored. You're like, how did that happen? Let me tell you how. God gave this church a burden for this city, a burden that led to people praying, and through their prayers, God revealed his vision for our church, and your response repeatedly has been to tell God yes and to move forward by faith. And you know what? God has blessed our yes every single step of the way. So thank you for being a church that continues to say yes. And thank you for believing God for great things. A while back, I was having lunch with some men in our church, and we were talking about ideas for future expansion. And I brought up this idea of the possibility of purchasing some additional land next to our church. And one of the guys in that meeting just said, you know, that's going to be pretty tough. I don't know if that's even possible because of this or because of that, like we've tried this before and for whatever reason, it's just never worked out. And in that conversation, I heard what they were saying, but I also believe that God was prompting us to have faith in this moment. And I felt like God was challenging us to trust him in this thing that we consider to be improbable, if not even impossible. So you know what we did? We prayed about it. And after we prayed together, I, I, got, back to, uh, I got back to the church and I grabbed my duck boots out of my truck. And I put my duck boots on and I walked from the church next to that field next to us. And I just started walking around that field. And I wasn't just walking around the field. I was praying in that field. And I'm sure people looked at me out in that field and thought I had lost my mind. They probably thought I was, I was crazy that day out there talking to the cows. But I wasn't talking to cows that day, I promise you. I was talking to the Lord. And I was telling him, Lord, if this is your plan, open this door. If this is your plan, do what we are incapable of doing. And I told them, we have a burden for this city. We believe that you've given us a vision for expansion. We want to move forward by faith. But if we're going to grow, you as the God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills are going to have to expand our territory and provide for us that which only you can provide. And you know what? It wasn't just me that was praying that. Our staff was praying. I asked our deacons to pray And it was about two weeks after all of us had been rallied in praying. About two weeks later, you know what happened? The phone rang out of the blue. And you know who was on the other line? A local realtor. And he said this. He said, I represent the family next door. And they would like to know if you just happen to be in a position where you have any interest at all in purchasing some additional property. Isn't that how God works? It is. So fulfilling God's vision is never impossible. Let me tell you something else that's interesting about that, that story. We bought the land next door. And when I say bought the land, I really mean finance the land, if I'm being completely honest. See, when God opened that door for us, we didn't have the money to pay for, for the land. And so we agreed to pay for the land by faith over the next couple of years. And the arrangement was for us to pay for this land with three equal installments. Each payment was going to be about $250,000. And I just want to be honest with you guys. That's a lot of money. 
That's a lot of money, and that's a big deal for us around here. People assume we've got all this money, but the truth is we don't sit on cash, a whole lot of cash. We don't see that as our job. Our job is to take dollars that are given for ministry and mobilize those for the kingdom of God around the world. And so we're not your bank, all right? We're not here to just hoard a bunch of cash. And because of that, we had to work out this deal with the bank. But here's the crazy part. Our second payment for that land is due next month. And very few people know this story. Our finance people certainly know it because they're crunching numbers and they're praying and trying to prepare for this upcoming payment. But here's the part I wanted to share with you today. Only a couple people know this. But, but a couple weeks ago, a lady called the church to schedule a meeting with our executive team. And she said, I've been coming here for years. I'm very active, but I'm really not even officially a member of this church. But this is home for me. This is where I'm fed. This is where I belong. And I believe the Lord has brought me here. And then she went on to say this. I believe God wants me to do my part. Get this. I believe God wants me to do my part to help pay for that land next door. She said, I feel a burden and I feel a responsibility to eliminate that debt as a part of this family. And then she ended with this question. She said, would a check for $200,000 help our church accomplish the mission? Isn't that good? Isn't that how God works, though? Listen, fulfilling God's vision is never impossible. It's only impossible if we say we are unwilling to do our part. That's when God's vision becomes impossible. When God's people say, let's hope somebody else does it, but I'm not going to do it myself. Let me tell you how that happens. It's going to happen when we rely on the Lord, but we're also faithful to the Lord. How do we fulfill our mission? It's when we all agree to do our part. It's going to take every single one of us doing our part. In fact, get this. God has given our church a burden for this city. So before we even move forward, I want you to ask the question, do I have a burden for this city? Do I even care? Do I have a burden for the kids and the grandkids who are being raised in this community? who will one day learn about the Lord? Do I care about the lost people who are moving to the city, looking for community? Do I care what happens in 100 years? Do I care if people go to heaven or hell? Because at the end of the day, if we don't care, then we're not going to move forward. And if you're not burdened for the city, you need to know your pastor is praying that God would wreck your life and give you a burden for the people that live in this community. Wreck you in a good way that sees the world through God lenses, not through your worldly eyes, but through God lenses saying, man, I want to care about the things God cares about. And let me tell you why I'm praying that prayer. It's because I know when your burden increases, so will your buy-in. And when your buy-in increases, so will your blessings. You buy into the things of God. What does God bless? He blesses obedience. And I believe he'll bless your buy-in. Let me tell you what the Lord has been showing me through Nehemiah's story. You ready? We will never build the wall that God is telling us to build until all of God's people are completely bought in. That's talking about all of us. And over the course of the next couple of weeks, I'm going to challenge you to pray this prayer with me as we look forward. Lord, am I doing my part as as your child? Am I doing my part to accomplish your vision and to complete our mission? Because when we can all answer that prayer and say, yes, I'm doing my part. I'm doing what God put me here to do. Then the wall is going to be built. The wall is going to be built. And God will be glorified. If you agree with that, say amen. Hey, would you just praise God with me today and thank him for being a part of a church that he's blessing?